Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Welcome to our virtual education series this month installment of our webinar. I see us trickling in here slowly but surely. Welcome again. I hope everybody's having a good day so far. Um, this month's uh, installment of our webinar series is called Advancing Bike Infrastructure Through Climate Legislation. Feel free to drop, drop a hello in the chat where you're coming from. Uh, it's a little bit chillier in Colorado today, but I hope everybody is having uh, good weather otherwise uh, throughout the country, wherever you're at. So to kick things off for today, uh, at the top here, my name is Ashley Seward. I'm Director of State and Local Policy at People for Bikes. Uh, and I'm so proud to be joined by Miguel Moravic from the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute, the Senior Associate from the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, to join me in speaking about all things climate legislation and bikes today. Uh, we have a lot to learn, so looking forward to it. And thank you again, Miguel, for joining. So a couple of housekeeping items uh, as we get started here. Apologies, I'm the owner of two corgis. And if you have corgis on the call, you know that they bark a lot. Uh, but just a couple of small things here. A reminder that the webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, and so any resources that we mentioned throughout the call, we'll share those after as well uh, with the recording as well as contact information so you can reach out to Miguel or I if you have any additional questions. Well, this is a short but sweet webinar, but we'll have time at the end. 30 minutes is the call, but we'll have time at the end for live Q&A if you have questions. So feel free to drop those in the chat or the Q&A section uh, and we'll have time for that. And one more item. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that People for Bikes is both a national advocacy organization as well as the trade association that represents the U.S. bike industry. And we have extensive resources online that both of those parties can benefit from. So if you're an advocate, policymaker, person from academia, please check out our website. We have more resources than just what's on this page here, but um, would love to share those with you so you can benefit and we can all uh, support the good cause of bike riding all across the country. And of course, if you're not already a member of People for Bikes from the industry side, again, extensive member benefits and feel free to reach out if you'd like to learn more about those after the call. Okay, so to some of the fun stuff, here's our agenda for today. Uh, I'm gonna walk us through the climate pillar of People for Bikes new great bike infrastructure project. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Miguel so we can learn a little bit more about GHG transportation builds as it relates to bikes and climate. Uh, that's happening across the country, as well as getting to learn a little bit more about RMI's Smart Modes Calculator and how that tool can be a powerful resource to support advocates and policymakers in making the case uh, for such builds. So let's get in to the Great Bike Infrastructure Project. So this is People for Bikes brand new campaign and the purpose of the campaign is to uh, accelerate the construction of safe and connected bike networks all across the country. And there are three main components of this campaign. The first is to build thousands of bike projects all across the country. The second is to invest in effective local advocacy. And the third, the reason that we are here today, is to advance state and local legislation that supports bike infrastructure, which is specifically my bread and butter of the campaign. There are four policy pillars of this campaign, uh, increasing bike infrastructure funding, mandating complete streets, lower speed limits through 20 is plenty campaigns, and of course, including bicycling and climate solutions, which I am so passionate about and excited for us to dig into today. Just a reminder, we've done similar webinars for the other pillars of the campaign. So lots of other content online if you're wanting to get additional information at any of those other policy priorities. Um, and we've created all of the best talking points, research, we found model legislation for all of these different areas if you'd like to promote them within your community. So on to the climate part. Uh, I wanted to give a couple facts here as to why we believe that bikes are a key part of the climate solution. Uh, the first being that bike infrastructure reduces greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle mild traveled. So, People who bike every day have an 84% lower carbon dioxide emissions from travel than of non-cyclists. And secondly, shifting car trips, short car trips to walking or biking and using walking and biking to access public transit saves 13 million tons of CO2 emissions annually. So this is a powerful tool that uh, we believe city, cities and states uh, should prioritize and take advantage of because it has a really great carbon reduction and VMT reduction benefit. 
Secondly, uh, achieving our climate goals requires additional strategies beyond electric vehicles. Electric vehicles hold an important place within a holistic, sustainable transportation system, but we believe that additional uh, a complementary approach approaches, such as transit and bike infrastructure, really aids in that holistic approach. Um, and we have also seen a couple of studies from California, Hawaii, Minnesota, uh, where states are analyzing how they can get to their climate reduction goals, their state climate goals. And it can't just be through GHG emissions alone. It has to be through VMT reductions, which is why bikes and transit are so powerful. And lastly, on the equity side of things, active transportation transportation infrastructure expands equitable access to low-cost, sustainable forms of transportation. The purchase, maintenancing, insurance, registration, and taxes that all come with the ownership of a car can be quite expensive um, and more expensive than the cost of a bicycle. So in order to support our community members where it makes more financial sense to own a bicycle uh, than to carry the cost of a car and maintaining a car, uh, we want to make sure we have the infrastructure for them to use a bicycle and safely travel. So I just gave you some of the whys. I want to give you some of the hows now. And this is within People for Bikes legislative guide that we uh, produced as part of this Great Bike Infrastructure Project campaign. Uh, so more information online if you'd like to read more. But here are just a couple of components of things that we believe are important to include when you're um, analyzing what types of climate strategies your state or community could implement. First being setting specific BMT and reduction, GHG reduction targets. I just explained the importance of that. Um, secondly, prioritizing mitigation strategies that provide co-benefits. So uh, mitigation strategies such as bike infrastructure and transit. Um, bike infrastructure uh, improves health, economic, economic conditions, safety, happiness, um, and it just has a lot of co-benefits. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, can can maybe even be higher in some eyes than some other uh, uh, transportation solutions. But we just believe that bike trips are happy trips and it comes with a whole host of uh, additional benefits when you prioritize investments um, in those areas. The third being here, prioritizing investments in disadvantaged and mar marginalized communities. I just spoke on the equity benefits of bike infrastructure within climate solutions. Uh, the fourth being here, establishing requirements for transparent reporting to measure and track the impact of your climate progress within your, your state's climate goals. Uh, it's just incredibly important to be transparent and make sure you're tracking on the progress in order to meet your climate goals. Uh, and lastly, but certainly not least, including electric bicycle incentive programs as a component of your overall climate strategy is something that we believe uh, can be incredibly useful. Uh, and we've created a whole host of resources on model legislation, best practices, data that we've collected all across the country for e-bike incentive programs and put it into one toolkit to make your life easy. So if you'd like to check that out, it's on our website as well. So that was a lot of information. And Miguel, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it to you. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and sharing your insights from RMI. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Really looking forward to sharing out uh, what we've seen in terms of state policies, uh, state policies that are leading on a mode shift that moves more dollars into bike infrastructure and out of uh, maybe uh, more polluting projects. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and let me know that you can see it all right. I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Well, hello again. My name is Miguel Moravec. I'm a senior associate at the Rocky Mountain Institute and part of our US program uh, focusing on policy here in the States. And today we're gonna talk about uh, the many benefits of including mode shift as an explicit climate strategy. So if you haven't heard of the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, we were founded over 40 years ago to answer one big question. If our energy systems were more efficient, what would the benefits to society be? Uh, so today, 40 years later, we're asking that same question in the transportation sector. If we can shift to more efficient modes like biking, uh, what would the benefits to society be? And our analysis on this topic has been frequently cited from state legislatures to national uh, publications covering the issue. Uh, fortunately, our home state of Colorado, where we were founded, um, is a national leader on mode shift policy. I'm going to talk a little bit today about how uh, prioritizing climate smart solutions and state transportation planning uh, leads to some really positive outcomes for mode shift. So uh, back in 2021, uh, the state of Colorado, looking to 
uh, meet its ambitious climate targets, um, passed a rule requiring the transportation agency to consider how its infrastructure, how its infrastructure projects from roadways to bike lanes uh, impact its ability to meet climate targets. Uh, how this works in micro is that the state DOT, the state transportation agency, actually assigns individual climate targets for the transportation sector uh, right down to its cities and metropolitan planning organizations. Uh, they run modeling on uh, how those cities are doing. And then they say, hey, if you're not in compliance with the climate target, here is your menu of options uh, to uh, offset the transportation pollution that we're expecting. So right out of the gate here, you can see a focus on uh, bicycle and other micro mobility solutions uh, to help get people out of their cars uh, and into uh, more affordable, uh, cleaner options. So that's how the policy works uh, in micro. But what was really impressive, a lot of states have iterated you know, various forms of uh, climate transportation policy, but this policy in Colorado actually moved uh, about uh, you know, a billion and a half dollars away from two previously planned highway expansion projects um, in Denver and instead shifted that money into a, a suite of clean transportation solutions, uh, including over $900 million uh, to expand bike, walk, and transit networks. So this is a, a policy that has teeth. It's, it's really effective. And, and as Ashley mentioned in the intro, you know, while we are gonna have uh, fossil fuel cars on the road for the next 10 to 20 years, um, expanding roadway projects, you know, we find that that will induce and actually add more pollution than it takes away, unlike out of the box solutions like bicycles, which you know are ready to reduce pollution now. Uh, something that came out of this rulemaking in Colorado uh, was that the state DOT forecast the benefit to society, uh, you know, should they achieve the climate targets. And uh, amazingly, the state found that by mode shifting into biking and buses and other multimodal solutions, residents would save over forty billion dollars a net benefit uh, by 2050. So we're gonna talk more about these benefits uh, later, but it certainly caught our eye. Uh, and the majority of these savings are kitchen table savings, uh, things like going to the gas station less often um, or having less car crashes since you know a vehicle travel is one of the most dangerous modes of transportation. We'll come back to these benefits in more, I do promise. Um, but to really zoom in, you know, it's been a few years since 2021, so the state has had some runway to implement uh, their climate smart planning. And instead of doing uh, sort of status quo projects, you know, here's just one example of how uh, more money is getting funneled into bike infrastructure as a result of climate smart planning. Uh, so here, the city of Aspen, you know, which had a pre-existing bike share uh, program, was able to expand and add 46 new e-bikes um, to comply with the local climate target that the state set for the transportation sector. So um, I know a question was submitted in advance about uh, calculating, you know, what does it mean to add, let's say like 46 bikes to your city? Um, there is a really great wealth of resources now from state departments of transportation um, who are figuring out uh, the climate benefit of, um, of adding a bike share, bike infrastructure and so on. And at the end of the presentation, I'll have an appendix with some other examples of formulas you can use to predict uh, the emissions uh, benefit of adopting more bicycle infrastructure. Um, so that was the Colorado case. Um, they're now you know, aligned uh, with their transportation uh, targets, which is exciting. Um, and uh, when I joined at RMI, we were interested in seeing if we could support this sort of policy in other states. So um, the short answer is yes. The long answer, I'll tell you the, the story of what happened uh, last year in 2023. Uh, through some coalition membership, we were able to talk about the Colorado example on Transit Equity Day uh, in St. Paul. Um, and a representative, uh, Larry Kraft, decided to author uh, very similar cl climate provisions um, in a transportation funding bill. Um, he went one step further than Colorado and also focused on vehicle miles traveled which is just a measure of you know, how many cars are using your uh, roadway and how far they're going. Um, the reason he focused on vehicle miles traveled and not just climate uh, is because as Ashley mentioned at the beginning, 
um, you know, there's this recognition now that we're not going to hit climate targets by just electrifying. We need sticky metrics uh, that support mode shift, uh, like reducing uh, car centric, uh, you know, car dependency. Okay. Um, something else exciting about this bill was that they uh, tried to make sure that the mitigation options, right, like adding, uh, let's say, bike share, uh, they wanted to make sure that these mitigation options were, uh, uh, you know, if if possible, located in areas of persistent poverty or uh, in historically disadvantaged communities. So there was this equity piece as well. Now, as you can imagine, and maybe you've been wondering this since the beginning of the presentation, but aren't there folks against this? Aren't there folks against uh, taking, a, uh, you know, money from, let's say, expansion projects or other, uh, you know, polluting projects and uh, putting those into cleaner modes? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, in April, so actually pretty close to the end of the legislative session in Minnesota, um, several different organizations came out in opposition uh, to the climate position provisions of the bill. Uh, to sort of summarize, uh, the rural communities uh, and counties, plus the uh, road builders and uh, asphalt producers, uh, took exception uh, to the policy. Um, but uh, the coalition of support uh, ultimately came out ahead. And I think there's this really unique moment uh, where, you know, longtime transit advocates, bike advocates are uh, meeting uh, with climate advocates and uh, really broadening the tent of support. Um, so this powerful new coalition of folks uh, armed with RMI analysis. So, you know, we uh, took that same cost benefit analysis from Colorado and said, hey, does that apply here in Minnesota? What would the benefits be? Um, uh, and the answer was a uh, $91 billion of, of net benefit since Minnesota had a more aggressive target than Colorado. So um, we'll come back to these analyses again for your state, don't worry. Um, but these analyses were uh, cited frequently in advocate, uh, you know, op-eds, uh, fact sheets, and uh, again on the House floor, uh, that's the bill sponsor, Larry Kraft there, um, you know, pointing out our, our study. And the, the truth is the opposition really did not have any numbers about the benefits of maintaining the car status quo. Um, they just, they just could not produce any, uh, you know, reasonable cost savings from that. So... The bill was passed into law in May of last year. Uh, got to go out to Twin Cities and uh, watch the governor sign it at the end of the session. Um, and something else that happened in this larger transportation funding bill um, was also an e-bike subsidy, which was really exciting. Um, uh, Minnesota joins Colorado in having a statewide uh, subsidy program. And a litany of other really positive, excuse me, really positive uh, clean transportation strategies. You know, you have to have land use and smart growth uh, as part of the conversation to you know, make destinations closer together so that they're in biking range, uh, for example. Um, a lot of states have restrictions on how funding can be shared, right? You can't just, uh, you know, take money from that project and put it over here. So in Minnesota, they chose to uh, raise some more uh, money for transit and multimodal solutions via a sales tax and an e-commerce fee happy to answer any questions on revenue raising. There's a lot of creative policies going around right now for that. Uh, and, and they also, uh, in Minnesota, did some uh, other, you know, rail and charging expansions that I, I won't get into now. But um, the opportunity here, uh, clearly this policy is moving. Uh, there are other states uh, considering it. So uh, New York and Maryland both have uh, legislation introduced right now to shift investments based on both climate and vehicle miles traveled reduction targets. So, so mode shift is coming up uh, um, uh, and a, a few other states have various different attempts at this. Um, so if you want your state to get involved, uh, fortunately we at RMI have already answered that question, uh, seeing the success of the Minnesota analysis, what would happen if all 50 states uh, prioritize the cleaner and more affordable modes uh, like biking. And the result of that effort was what's called the Smarter Modes Calculator. Um, and what the Smarter Modes Calculator does, it's not, it's not a prescription on how you're going to get from, you know, now to climate alignment, but it does calculate the benefits, the co-benefits of the destination. So uh, basically, if, if you were to achieve a 20% per capita mode shift relative to 2019, what would those co-benefits uh, be? Um, 
this is the national context, um, but it really speaks to why we can't do this with electric vehicles alone. Um, if we were to achieve just the one in five, you know, trip reduction away from cars and into other modes or uh, avoided trips, uh, the difference is a, is a really whopping three gigatons of climate pollution savings. So you, we still, it's a yes and approach. We still need electrification, right? Um, what, between this blue and yellow line, those are the savings from uh, a mid-range, so uh, uh, mid-range EV adoption. So some states are going to go harder than others in the U.S. Uh, but there's an additional three gigatons of savings if we also incorporate that mode shift element. And to to put some perspective on that, uh, that is the same as if you know me, Ashley, Toby, Maddie, and everyone on this call, and every other American went home like unplugged their house from the grid for five years, the pollution saved from that is the pollution savings uh, that that come with mode shifts plus vehicle electrification. So it's really, really important as we are running out of time to hit climate targets uh, to do everything we can um, uh, to to stay on track. Um, but even if even if you don't buy the climate argument at all, the family savings uh, from mode shift, uh, we can't afford to leave on the table. So, uh, assuming that 20% mode shift, just one in five trips out of cars were to occur between uh, gradually between now and 2050, um, the average U.S. household would save something in the order of like $2,000 per year. But we don't assume anybody sells any of their cars. Uh, the average American household has two vehicles. But if you could just use your vehicles less, there's a lot of money to be saved from less gas and maintenance trips. And depreciation, the uh, you know, the loss of value from adding miles to your odometer also results in really significant cost savings when it's time for a family to trade in a vehicle or downsize um, and, and sell their car. So um, we have these numbers for all 50 states. Uh, I'll, I'll show you at the end how you can um, access them. Um, and we have a lot more co-benefits in the calculator, but the last two that I'll highlight are the health savings. Uh, we can't discount that the current transportation system uh, causes something like you know forty thousand uh, car crash fatalities per year. So mode shift, you know, number one in dark blue, uh, by definition avoids the uh, probability of quite a few uh, car crash fatalities per year across the U.S. It's something like uh, six thousand uh, on average could be avoided per year. Um, but the really exciting thing about mode shift, especially when you mode shift to like an active form of transportation rather than just another car is that there's significant cardiovascular benefits where uh, just uh, assuming one in 25 of your trips are shifted to either a, a brisk walk or a bike ride, uh, just, just that small shift in trips would uh, uh, save thousands of lives per year from avoiding premature inactivity-related uh, health complications and fatalities. So uh, when you add up the avoided car crashes, when you have cleaner air, and you also consider all of the uh, life uh, uh, elongating properties of active transportation like biking, uh, you end up saving, uh, if, if all 50 states were to do this, it'd be like saving the entire uh, Dodger Stadium, the largest uh, baseball stadium here in the US. Uh, if you had, took all those fans, 56,000 of them, uh, you're, 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 you'd be elongating and, and avoiding that many premature fatalities. So. Um, the active transportation benefits cannot be discounted. And this is a very conservative um, uh, uh, rate, you know, just assuming only a few of your uh, car trips are replaced, one in 25, uh, by, by biking or walking. So uh, if you have larger mode shift, there's even, even more benefit. Um, talking here to this audience, I know you all know the positive health benefits of biking, but to, to monetize it and put some numbers on it for you, uh, you know, looking at the fuel savings, looking at the uh, you know avoided uh, health outcomes, the monetized benefit is something like a trillion dollars per year in the United States uh, by lowering costs and improving health and safety outcomes. So it's uh, nothing uh, to shake a stick at. It's quite a lot of benefit. Um, and you can go online if you just search uh, uh, smarter modes on uh, your preferred search engine and see your state's results. We have an interactive map that you can just click on uh, have Illinois uh, here uh, with their benefits uh, to see the uh, what are the kitchen table savings from uh, just a little bit of mode shift, one in five. We think that's realistic uh, for each and every state. 
Um, and if you want even more are my calculators and tools on the subject of biking and e-bikes. Uh, I wanted to share some uh, other resources we have as well. So one resource, if, especially for a city uh, level context, is our, our e-bike calculator. So based on a, a pilot program uh, in Denver, we saw that there were uh, um, verifiable uh, VMT reductions, so verifiable mode shift, uh, once the city of Denver put forward an, an e-bike uh, pilot program. And we've now scaled that uh, analysis to over 200 cities across the US. So you can go in and say, hey, if I throw $10 million at an e-bike subsidy program in my city, what would the climate benefit be? What would the cost savings be? Um, and all sorts of other economic and health benefits uh, based on a subsidy of that size. So and this is a really specific granular tool for uh, figuring out citywide e-bike programs as compared to the Smarter Modes calculator, which is looking at a larger societal benefit from a mode shift in general. Um, so we have uh, this tool here. And uh, on the subject of figuring out, hey, you know, maybe I'm applying for a grant, maybe I'm applying for federal funding, I really want to quantify uh, you know, what my new bike lane is going to do in terms of, uh, of carbon reduction. Uh, fortunately, a lot of state DOTs, uh, most of them, have now created what are called uh, carbon reduction strategies. Uh, this was part of a bipartisan infrastructure law program where uh, you know, each state received hundred million, hundreds of millions of dollars, excuse me, to, to go out and uh, plan and uh, uh, you know, update their transportation system to be more climate friendly. So you can go and find these carbon reduction strategies for your state, and you'll have state specific uh, formulas and numbers for the benefit of, let's say in this case, adding a bike pet facility uh, next to a roadway with a certain amount of traffic. Um, this is from Illinois carbon reduction strategy. But we also have a great example here from Minnesota, um, where uh, this formula, you know, gets into the numbers of days per year that would be good to bike uh, times the miles of bike lane and and uh, so on. Um, so there's lots of great material out there in the state carbon reduction strategies to start to quantify very specific project level uh, granularity benefit. Um, all right. So with that, uh, we'll try and answer any other questions that have rolled in from the chat. That's my email. Uh, please think of RMI and our, our data tools when you're uh, looking to make decisions around uh, investing in bicycle infrastructure, especially for the climate context. And uh, thanks again, Ashley, for, for having me on. Thank you, Miguel. Oh my goodness, that was so much good information. Uh, again, we are such fans and some RMI's calculators and your data tools, and it's just so helpful uh, in our advocacy efforts. Um, we are close to time, so I'm just gonna pick out one, maybe two, if we can squeeze it questions here. But, you know, me personally, uh, in a government affairs team, I'm really excited about the possibility of more states replicating the Minnesota, Colorado, California um, policies, GHG policies. Uh, we do have one question here in the chat of, uh, wanting to know a little bit more about the headwinds in Minnesota or some of the other arguments that were, you know, against the movement of, of such a policy. Is there is there any additional insight you can give there or advice for the future? Yes. Um, so, you know, a lot of the times, uh, you know, rural communities, we've, we've not done a good job of communicating the benefits of like bike infrastructure or uh, just having more transportation options. So I think one thing to keep in mind is like, how do we have the most compelling uh, vision for the rural counties that are gonna you know, also be party to these state level uh, um, policies? Something that we did uh, in, in Minnesota was included expanding broadband access, right? So that folks could you know, telework or access like telehealth resources, um, but also in the US, more than half of car trips are less than five miles. And with the advent of e-bikes, that suddenly is you know, a very competitive uh, a distance to, to use an e-bike on. Um, and folks just don't know that yet. So you know, there, there is a compelling vision of making protected bike infrastructure, even in maybe rural, rural parts of your state, um, so people can uh, 
tap into the cost savings and the health benefit and just like the enjoyment of, of, of using bicycle infrastructure. So that's that's one thing to consider um, when uh, working with folks who maybe aren't downtown and don't don't see the, the urbanism vision. Yeah, those co-benefits are expensive. Um, well, wonderful. So we're over on time. I don't want to make anybody late to any other meetings that you have scheduled after this, but thank you so much again, Miguel. Uh, we'll send out the follow-up email with the recording, uh, links to Smart Modes Calculator, you'll have our slides, uh, and please uh, check out uh, peopleforbikes.com for our great bike infrastructure project campaign. Um, thank you all again for joining. I hope everyone has a good rest of your Thursday and good rest of your week. Thanks, Ashley. And if you email me your questions, folks, I will answer them. I I, I think uh, I've, I've been asked most of the seven in the or so in the chat. So please email me. Happy to continue the conversation. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ashley.